Well, I want to welcome you to my, to my gallery. I'm Lynn Fox. Um, if you're watching on uh, my website, welcome to you. Thank you for, for watching. So um, I'm going to do a little short gallery talk on my summer show. And it's called Black, Minimalism, Minimalism, easy for me to say, and Beauty in Historic Tiwa Pottery. And I did a, uh, a little book and, and catalog um, that you may want to look at. There, there's some uh, back there. Um, so it's an interesting area of, of, of art. The, the, the black pottery um, from the northernmost, not the northernmost city, the Pueblos just north and west of Santa Fe. So San Ildefonso, Santa Clara, Pueblos. The black pottery is well known. And it's well known because a couple of potters um, became very famous working in this type of pottery. One was Maria Martinez who early in the 20th century, century became one of the first potters to sign. She invented something called black on black, where you see polished pottery, but it's got matte designs on it. And then Margaret de Foya from Santa Clara Pueblo became very well known for producing highly polished, beautiful Santa Clara pottery. Those people are deservedly famous. My interest has been more in earlier pottery. So the pieces that I have in, in this show are from the Tiwa speaking Pueblos, concentrating just on Santa Clara and San Juan Pueblo. San Juan now, now referred to by its ancestral name, O.K. Owinge, but most people more familiar with San Juan. I'll continue to refer to it as San Juan. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about and show you a few examples is pottery from the 19th century that was made for utilitarian wear, wear in, in the home. And, and it shows it. It shows ethnographic wear. And then we're going to carry it through to a rapidly emerging and evolving tourist trade somewhere around 1930 and see what happens to that pottery. Pottery stays beautiful, but a fundamental change takes place that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. So, the pots that I've chosen, if you had been in here just kind of watching me set up, you know, you would have just kind of laughed because I was like up and down on chair. It's, it's like trying to pick um, which of your 12 children you're going to show off to somebody who wants to meet your, your best children. So, um, you know, first I had, uh, I had this piece up and I had the bowl up and I thought, you know, black with a splash of red would be nice. And San Juan not only did black on gray forms, but San Juan also did red on tan. I thought, oh, a red piece would be, I, I had 20 different pots out here before I realized I love them all, so just pick some that might flow in a bit of a story for you. So let, let me just uh, talk a little bit about um, each of these pots. So Jonathan Batkin, who uh, you, some of you may, may know the name, he, he's the executive director of a wonderful small museum in Santa Fe called the Wheelwright Museum. He wrote a book on historic Pueblo pottery about 20 years ago. In that book, in the section on Santa Clara pottery, he simply says, Santa Clara potters were masters of form. I've always felt that and have always loved Santa Clara pottery. So, you know, the, the, the title of, of my show, Black Minimalism and, and, and Beauty. Well, the minimalism refers to the fact that, that the other side of Pueblo pottery that many people know are the brightly painted historic pots. You go to Indian markets, you see lots and lots of, of painted pottery. All beautiful in their own right. I'm not going to try to convince you that one's better than the other. I may have them both in my gallery and, and, and I love them. But the subtlety of this form of pottery is, is just, to me, just so, so wonderful. And when you look at, at black pottery from Santa Clara and San Juan Pueblo and look at the variety of the forms and look at, at how much of an artistic feel they were able to generate from just subtle differences between the pots, this is a wonderful, wonderful area to explore. Because of the interest in Maria Martinez and Margaret de Foya as being the big superstars in, in this particular area as the 20th century commences, an interesting thing happens in the market. This type of pottery, in a sense, because it's not necessarily Margaret de Foya, it's not necessarily Maria Martinez, these become sort of like poor stepchildren. And so you go in some of the galleries and you might see a wonderful piece of black pottery like this, but not ten grouped together. 
sort of back in an old shelf, gathering dust. It wasn't Maria, it wasn't Margaret, it wasn't as expensive, it wasn't as profitable. And so it's been a long, long time since anyone gathered together historic tea pottery like this to see how wonderful it looks in a small collection together. So that, was a, that was the thrust of, of, of what I try to do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, each of these. Just a minute or two on, on each one. We're going to stay within uh, about 15 minutes for this talk. Um, so let's just start here. This is a, a wonderful form. Um, it's known as a dough bowl. A friend of mine uh, was asking me about where the donut bowl was, and uh, we, I won't point them out because you won't want to throw them out of the room, but you know, it wouldn't be a nice thing to do. So this is a dough bowl. It's a large form made for kneading dough, storing bread. Now what's interesting about this is by the 1890s, this wonderful dough bowl, rare from Santa Clara Puebla, was probably among the last of its kind. By the 1890s, manufactured cookware was available in the little town of Española north of Santa Fe. These forms are hard to make and not many potters can work large like this. And plus one breaks, all of a sudden you have to pick another one. Well, you can buy inexpensive cookware now at Española. No more dough bowls were being made then at Santa Clara. In the 1890s, no one considered these to be great art either. So tourists weren't buying them. The museums weren't even buying them. The fact that this one managed to be plucked off the Pueblo and survived to this day is a near miracle. This is the first Santa Clara dough bowl I've seen in 20 years on the market. And as you can see, it's just very, very wonderful. It's a masterpiece of potting because like all these forms, these are hand coiled pots and then traditionally fired outside. We'll talk about firing in a minute. Very hard to make because the drying process is so important, takes so much skill. If a potter tries to make this pot too fast, the weight of it as it grows up these walls collapses in itself. So it became certain potters that were the ones who would make the large forms. So this is a wonderful bowl. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pottery dealer. I'll be very happy if people buy some of my pots. This is the one I'll be happy for about three minutes before I go, oh my gosh, where am I ever going to find another one? And chances are I won't. So very subtle, very lovely in its utilitarian history and very, very basic form, just subtle curves, a slightly flaring rim. In the 1890s, Santa Clara potters were capable of much more in the way of complexity in pottery design. This stunning piece of pottery exhibits so much, we could talk about this pot the rest of, of, of this session. But notice it starts very narrow at the base, flares out to this wide mid-body. Remember, these pots are being made with coils of snake, like we, like we did in kindergarten, making you know, snakes out of clay. That's, that's what this potter turned her snakes out of clay into. Then there is what is uh, kind of a little ridge and a flattened area that would later be called a rainbow, ba ra rainbow band by the Tafoya family. And then pie crust rim flaring up. It's a gorgeous early pot. And this type of pot became a prototype for the later tourist wear, um, such as where did I put that big wide one? Okay, help me out, guys. Okay. Where's the big wide? Oh, this one right here, which is now a very classic form of artistic uh, contemporary Santa Clara pottery, although this one from about 1925 to 1930. So it's an interesting thing to watch here as we start looking at the transition from utilitarian wear into the art market. Can you, can you make out, I don't know if you can capture that, Dylan, but uh, can you see that it's not all black here? Mm -hmm. you know, it's bleeding through, it's kind of a reddish, yellowish um, highlight. <clears throat> well, where the black comes from is there's a natural firing process. And the fuel that's used in the outdoor firing process is um, horse manure. And in the early days, um, pinon wood was used as a firing uh, uh, fuel. And then to get the black, that at a certain point in the firing, a ton of manure is thrown onto the fire, takes the oxygen out of, of the, uh, the firing process, blackens the pot. 
Well, as the tourist market would, would evolve, and if you go to Indian market this year, and you see black pottery, all black. All black, beginning in the mid-1930s. Because the Fred Harvey Company in the 1920s starts bringing tourists to Santa Clara. More and more and more, those tourists and dealers start influencing the finished product. More and more and more, they start saying, you know, I really don't want blemishes on my pottery. I want it perfect. So perfect to the Pueblo people didn't mean something the same as what it was meaning by to the art buyers. So take a look at this lovely form. So this is a large, it's called an olla, large water jar. There's so much to love on this pot. This is, this is an, an extravaganza of pottery making. There is an indenture here to form another rainbow band. There's what's these finger impressions, so they're in, intruded elements that you can feel on the inside and then extruded elements in between. There's a, whoops, there's a bear paw right here. If you get close, you can see that this pot isn't bright and shiny like this. Why is that? Well, this pot was made for use at home. Even in 1910 to the 1920s, at Santa Clara Pueblo, pots were being used. So for a pot to be used and be able to withstand liquids and food and everything else, it has to be hard fired, high temperature fired. Once you get high temperature, this dulls out. 